Do you see it now? No. And neither can Ellen Smith. <laughs> can they hear me? <coughs> no. no they can't see, hear I would get it here. No, I just got a thing that said Jim Pike is live now. All right, you've got Just it. me? Or your well, phone. It's your phone. Your phone. But is it in the class? <laughs> Is it in the class, though? Well, I, I got four people yeah, watching, right? Uh, we got it now. Okay. Yay. Yay. Okay. All right. I'm not going back to the beginning. I have no <laughs> idea where. <laughs> I'd love to know where I'm, it I'm went so before. Sorry. <laughs> it's the same thing that I did before, uh, just this time it's took. So, I don't yeah. Know. So. so you can email me, and I'll tell you all the bad. So <laughs> <laughs> things start with the bad. All right. Let's, let's move. So just say you're doing the, oh. the good, bad, and the ugly of being a house a hospital. Yeah, I, I'm Gina yeah. Biddle. I'll go back to that part. I'm a hospital chaplain at UT Southwestern. I've been there. This is my 20th year, and my talk today is going to be on the good, the bad, the ugly of a hospital chaplain. Here we go. Uh, so I talked about my growing up in Detroit and all of that. Uh, those things that happened there, if you can imagine, of course, helped to form who I am today as well. Uh, the ugly, I will say, is the loss I had, of course, with loss, losing all my, my parents and my brother and waking up at 28 years of age, an orphan, and uh, also had um, been in a very bad abusive marriage, which is another thing that, uh, uh, that was bad and ugly that occurred in my life. Uh, and I was living in Houston at the time, uh, worked at MD Anderson. So I, my undergrad is medical records, I have to go back and tell you that. So I hadn't always been um, pursuing a career as a hospital chaplain. So. Uh, but so that, that happened and I, I was invited to go to uh, Brentwood Baptist Church by a girlfriend and so when I went there in Houston to Brentwood I met um, Reverend Herb Brisbane who was the minister of the singles group and so that group met uh, the second and fourth Tuesday evenings and so I started going with her and just to uh, you know, have some social time, I thought, and comes to discover that um, Reverend Brisbane was an awesome, awesome pastor and leader. And the first talk he did was about baggage. And I had a lot of baggage by the time I was 28. And so I was quite intrigued with that. And he went on to talk about how to sort that, work through it, and to come uh, to become a Christian after having worked through all our baggage. And he was also a great counselor. Um, so I did pursue counseling with him. And I must say for um, my first experience uh, being with the minister and in the quiet of an office, I was also uh, able to say that he was a good man. He was forthright. He always had his secretary outside the room. The door was open. My history of knowing black pastors in Detroit was a lot of hanky-panky, I'll just say. And so Reverend Brisbane really proved to me he was forthright and, and um, was an awesome leader. So I got very, very involved in missions under uh, at Brentwood Baptist Church as well. And um, so from there, I uh, continued my work at MD Anderson and other places in Houston. And Reverend Brisbane in the fall of 89 said, God told me to tell you to go to Southwestern Seminary. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you heard the past, and I'm thinking all the bad and the ugly I have in my life. And I know Southwestern Seminary is quite conservative school. And uh, God didn't tell me to go there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was a little hesitant about that. I will say, um, also I forgot to mention about my past, I'm, I'm ex-military. I was in the Army from 74 to 77, 
went to Southwest Texas State with the GI Bill and made B, maybe a one or two Bs, but mostly Cs, just enough to get by. So I really didn't think I could get into Southwestern Seminary with my history of my grades and all, but um, believe it or not, they accepted me and I thought, hmm, I was a little bit shocked about that. Uh, and I thought, there must be a God, because he let me <laughs> into Southwestern <laughs> Seminary, and uh, as a black female or black person, there was only four or five on campus at the time that I went uh, 89 to 95. So I was still wondering about this God who chose me to, to go to Southwestern Seminary. And so during that time at Southwestern Seminary, I was um, a member of South Hills Baptist Church. And South Hills is also a more white church. Uh, myself and three other people were uh, African American members. And so they supported me and loved me through many my years of seminary, of loss and counseling and all of that. Um, and I received so much love from them. Um, it's just been an amazing journey, um, starting at that church, as well as my journey here at Wilshire is very similar. Um, so after that, I um, finished seminary and being divorced, you can't get a job in a church. And the business chaplains don't want you because you're divorced at the time, 95. and. So I found myself uh, looking for the next part of my life and my journey. And I was introduced to chaplaincy by the hospital chaplain at John Peter Smith, where I was employed with my degree in medical records. So, and he said, do you ever think about being a chaplain? And I was like, well, you have to do it full time. He goes, well, Hughley has a part-time program. And I thought, oh. So again, uh, as I didn't say, but I put myself through seminary over five years, taking two classes a semester. So then through CTE, I also worked full time and did the training to be a chaplain. And after that, I thought, okay, I'm ready for this world. I'm ready to be a chaplain. And the Lord said, hold up one more, one, one minute now. You're not quite that ready. So I received a call from Baylor here in Dallas and they wanted me to be a chaplain. Uh, in training and I thought you know I was holding my tongue because I didn't want to say no but what was this leading to um, so I found out there at Baylor there was still more work I needed to do on my family background and my dealing with uh, black men in my life and so one of my supervisors happened to be a black man and it was just like okay Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, year was very pivotal uh, in me becoming who I am today as well. Uh, and in between all that, I met my current husband, Chris Greaves, and um, we dated for four years because I was scared to death. And he was like very patient and waited. Um, and so we were married in the summer of 2001. August, I was ordained by South Hills Baptist Church in July 2001 as well, uh, which, you know, uh, you're looking at me and you see that I'm an African-American female divorced, and yes, I am an ordained uh, Baptist minister, which was <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, and that's, I think, at that point in my life, I really realized that um, the Lord was leading me, directing me, guiding me, protecting me, and had brought me through many, many mountains and valleys in my life. And I still did not know the purpose um, of all of that, but I knew I was on the right track. So as a hospital chaplain, uh, I discovered it's a mission field. And it's so many opportunities to witness by presence, but not by uh, proselytizing uh, happened in my life so many, many, many times. I can't tell you 
the thousands and thousands of people I've been able to be present with at the bedside, um, supporting them. Uh, I've done some weddings. They were on the news a couple of years, well, about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I did a wedding at the bedside, and then I've done a couple of others as well for patients who were at the end of life and their children were planning weddings, and so we did those at the hospital. Um, so there's, there's an lot, awful lot of good um, that has come out of my, my history and my life. And another very good thing, I'm not, I've never been a mother, and so a very dear friend of mine um, allowed me to be the godmother to her son, and he is just a, the joy of my life and uh, never um, understood what motherhood would be like, but he is that to me. He is about six foot three, blonde haired and blue eyed, <laughs> and his mom and dad may be five two on a good day. <laughs> so I think Jake is definitely my son, and, uh, <laughs> definitely a gift from God, and he loves Chris and I and like you would not believe. And Jake is an auto mechanic, and where did I come from? Detroit, Car City. So. <laughs> We share that, we send pictures back and forth about all these exotic cars we see or the cars that he has worked on that are exotic cars. So um, very, very joyful to have him in my life as well as his sister, Rachel. Um, um, and some stories about being a hospital chaplain I wanted to be able to go into. Uh, it's about 10, 17. Any questions thus far? Uh, yes, question. Being you, you're a chaplain at Baylor, and whenever I've been into a lot of the church, a lot of the hospitals I've been in, it seems like all the chaplains are Baptist, and you're Baptist, mm -hmm. being, however, a different Baptist. Mm -hmm. What uh, are there limitations, especially like at Baylor? Do they limit chaplains to being only Baptist or? You would think that if they're a Catholic, do they, is a chaplain ever a Catholic mm -hmm. priest? Um, uh, yes. Um, Baylor may have been just supporting the Baptists because that's their foundation for years. I think now that they're Scott and White, things may have changed. Um, but presently, um, we uh, Catholics can go through the training, but the Catholic chaplains cannot be ordained. Only a priest can be ordained. And so we have several women Catholic chaplains at UT Southwestern, but they are not ordained, but they have gone through the process to be board certified uh, and are supported by the Catholic Church. And we do have a priest on staff. Uh, he has not gone through the process of the board certification, but he's our priest and chaplain and assigned to UT Southwestern. Uh, we have Methodists at UT Southwestern. We have United Church of Christ. Uh, we have Church of Christ. We have a variety of uh, backgrounds, Christian Disciples of Christ, chaplains as well, men and women both. Um, the process for becoming a chaplain is that the training, as well as I uh, explained earlier, so many hours of practical work as a chaplain, and then you go before a committee or a board to be board certified as a chaplain. And all of this started because, uh, as you, some of you may know, that the pro uh, some chaplains or ministers were going to the bedside and abusing their privileges. And so they wanted to make sure that they had a body of chaplains to support them, a church body also to be over them. So all of that came into play just to make sure that the hospital chaplains were accountable to uh, an outside organization to be to support them um, so there is it's called the Association of Professional Chaplains APC is the board certifying organization I'm under <clears throat> I am supported by CBF as well the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship um, locally so if I have any issues or anything that they would be involved in talking to me, supporting me, or representing me 
um, also, um, and each board certified chaplain has to have that foundation. They have to be, they have to have certification, I mean CPE, plus so many hours practical uh, work, and all of this is under the supervision of a board certified chaplain supervisor. Um, so they are, it's a teaching, it's called a resident. It's a residential pro, resident program, and so they are um, uh, residents. We have like six this year, and they are supervised by a supervisor. But to be board certified, they have to go through the other uh, certification process as well. Um, and that leads me into more of the good. Um, last year, or during COVID, I started applying. I am a palliative care specialized chaplain now. And so in the last two years, I applied for board certification as a palliative care chaplain. Define palliative. And palliative, palliative is, a, is supportive care for people who are at the end of their life and they're out of treatment options. A, lot, a basic way to explain that is pre-hospice, but a supportive care for someone who has a terminal diagnosis they may not be actively dying, but they have a terminal diagnosis that needs to be managed with pain, symptom management, social support, until I say God calls them home. Um, so that's what palliative care team is, um, palliative care is basically. Um, so I went up for this board certification uh, last year, and of course doubting again that I would get it, and I got it, just before my 65th birthday, and it was like, <laughs> okay, so I guess I'm not retiring or even looking at retiring. Uh, I really, really love this work, and I'm very, very, very passionate about it. And uh, I am um, so um, joyful to be able to do this and work with these patients and specialize in this care at the end of their life. And the, uh, I will give a plug out to why I think I can do this so well, as I've been doing jazzercise <laughs> since 1983. <clears throat> and that has helped to keep me fit and sharp. And I'm a Motown girl, so I love to dance. <laughs> I'm sorry, just, you know, I try not to, and Lord said, go back to dancing. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, being able to do this and stay healthy and be fit and be sharp, I'm, I'm very, very happy, help, happy about that gift. The board certification process uh, for palliative care is very grueling and it is, um, I would say, synonymous with what a nurse practitioner is or a physician assistant, a PA is. So, <coughs> I am at that level. Uh, I received a substantial raise, so I think I'm going to be working a little bit longer. <laughs> My husband is nine years older than I am, so you know now I can support the family well, and I'm very happy about that as well. Let him slow down a little bit. Um, you, questions? What would you, as someone who goes to visit someone in the hospital, myself say? what would, or any of us, we all have to at some point, what would you recommend? Is there things that you see when people come to visit that they're doing wrong or shouldn't do or shouldn't say or should do or should say in your ob observations? Um, well, if you feel threatened or anything or, you know, and many times some nurses may not take care of you well or the doctor may not treat you accordingly or you might see the tech has been rude to you or something, and definitely use your voice. Don't be afraid to say something to the nurse manager um, or the supervisor that's on for the day <clears throat> that your care was not well. Um, and you know, a lot of people feel intimidated by the white coats that come into the room, but you are the center of our attention and we need to be providing your care well and it's a, you know, there's a way to use your voice, a professional way, and you just go up that chain to make sure that your voice is heard and that your care is well according to 
what you believe that care should be. But as us as visitors going to see someone, you know, I always heard, don't sit on the bed. Well, that's, that's another number one chaplain yeah. rule. It's not about me and we don't sit on the bed because that's the patient's bed and we shouldn't intimidate that special part for them. And I think, again, going back, that's where some people took advantage of the vulnerability of our patients by sitting on the bed. That's a little bit close for me. Um, we have little stools and chairs we can pull up, uh, and some of the young chaplains actually will kneel at the bedside. Um, but definitely, uh, I think that's a no-no. That's a little bit too close for comfort. Um, you can stand or you can pull up a chair and, and you can be supportive that way. And we also have the bed rails, which should be up, <clears throat> to protect that person from falling out of bed or getting out of bed. So those are some barriers that are, are supportive to you. And another thing I'd like to advise everyone is that there may be certain precautions of seeing a patient that may have an infection or they may have these signs on the door. If you don't recognize them and don't understand them, ask someone to help you. You may need to gown and glove up before going in because that patient may have an infection that can be contagious to you or you may bring something in to the patient if they're immunocompromised, which means they don't have any ability to fight off an infection. And number one, <clears throat> if you have a cough or sniffles, do not go to the hospital. The hospital, <clears throat> excuse me, the hospital is full of sick people. <clears throat> so you don't want to go there and get sicker or bring your illness into the hospital. And we have the gift of these phones with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with video, so you can also video uh, chat with a person or you can call them on the phone. I have a couple of comments. Y'all may or may not know, I work at Baylor University Medical Center and so that's, I'm a physician, mm -hmm. and so the chaplains are our constant partners and so we can't run the hospital without them. So I have one comment about being at bedside with patients and um, that is, conversation with them and really connect with them instead of them, you know, looking up and um, you'd be surprised and there's a lot, you know, patients have a lot of times trouble understanding what you're saying in the first place, they're processing a lot of things and I think that getting down to their eye level and having eye contact with them is, is really important. Um, the other thing I want to say is I don't know if you guys realize Okay, good question. Chaplains can serve in various roles. I, I did touch on it a little bit about what I could not be, and they have business 
uh, like Kraft, I believe, has a chaplain on board. Prisons have chaplains. Um, larger businesses will have them. Uh, and some, hop in lots of churches, they'll call them the pastoral care group, and those are generally uh, chaplains that are running that pastoral care uh, in the churches. Um, the airport has a chaplain. The military, all branches of the military have a chaplain as well. So in various, various um, areas, they, um, they will have a chaplain or in some instances, a social worker, or a licensed social worker as a counselor. Um, our visits are um, private uh, and legally binding. <clears throat> we can refuse to testify about our conversations as an ordained minister with a person. So that's um, how we are protected a lot of times with having a confidential conversation with a patient. Um, but there, are, and it's, it's spreading more and more um, that people are realizing the value of chaplain support and non-binding. And a lot of times we don't um, we don't talk about our religion. We're just open, uh, loving, and confidential person for people to talk to. So, I, you know, unless they ask, I don't tell anybody about my background. I'm more interested in them. That's why I said in the beginning, it's about you, not about me. So this is a difficult position for me to be in to talk about me. Because I want to be supportive and loving to you. Um, <clears throat> and excuse me, that leads me to a couple of stories. Um, as you can see, of course, again, I'm an African-American female, and back in my early days at Zale Lipshi, I befriended a Muslim patient who uh, didn't want any other chaplain at his bedside but me. And so we journeyed along together. This was before palliative care, and uh, he told me about his Islamic faith and I, he was curious about Jesus and so we talked and shared and loved on each other. Um, and that patient eventually went home to Pakistan to pass away. Um, but he would not accept the visit from anyone other than me. And recently, last year, I had the beautiful opportunity to be with a state trooper of the Schultzes, and Mike Schultz was Lutheran, and I had visited him and supported him. He was a palliative care patient, and uh, he wanted to, uh, a he wanted to be baptized, and he wanted last rites. And I'm not that familiar with the Lutheran faith, and so he said, "You know, you'll do fine." <laughs> and so I, you know, did my research and was able to provide that support to him. Uh, I am so amazed every day that I get to do what God has called me to do and I got to love on him in Christ's name, not in my physical sense, but in Christ's name. And his father, um, and I, I, I also, you know, I, I wonder about some of these patients' background, how loving and caring and open and accepting they are. And Mike's father was a uh, civil rights attorney here in Dallas back in the 60s for mixed couples okay. and once I got to meet his dad I was just I was like well I know why Mike is who he is his parents are both just loving and caring and considerate and they've made uh, a small donation to our palliative care team in Mike's name so we can continue to do what we do, support patients with special things like books and, and um, shawls. We do prayer shawls and, and uh, reading material to support families at the end of life. So that has been another thing that's been amazing. Can you speak up some? You're getting low. You're oh, am I? You know, <clears throat> I'm supposed to be at the bedside. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I'm, and, and I'm all of six foot two, and I usually am booming my voice, but I'm, I'm at the bedside, and I apologize for that. Uh, 
How yeah. did you find Wilshire? Well, I'll tell you, that's part of the bad and the ugly and the good. <laughs> I um, was at uh, UT Southwestern. I was visiting, I was attending a different church, a different denomination. And the manager there uh, basically threatened me that I was not attending a Baptist church. And he was threatening me with possible loss of my job. So I, um, uh, this was during the Ebola time, so I walked over, I visited a couple of times and, and um, had went to Dr. Mason's office and talked to him about women in ministry. and. So I came in the office and they were like, what do you want? And it was kind of like, I'm coming to join the church. And they looked at me like, you know, but it was during Ebola. So people were, you know, uh, uh, different uh, uh, TV per people were coming in and asking questions and trying mm -hmm. to get through and sneak in any kind of way. And I was like, no, 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 I'm Baptist. I need to join a Baptist church. So. Uh, it, that's how I dropped into Wilshire, and I'm telling you, I couldn't be more happier being here and in discovery class. Mark's talk about being loving everybody really uh, opened my eyes um, because I thought I was open and welcoming and affirming of all God's children, and I wasn't in certain areas. Uh, and at the when you're in the hospital at the bedside. These are all God's children. They come in all shapes and sizes. They have different creeds. They have different relationships, marriages. And, you know, my goal is to love them and be accepting to them and welcoming to them. And I learned a lot with that. And so it has really blossomed, uh, even though that was, I was kind of forced to be here. Um, but I'm very glad that I am, and I think in another way, God said, you know, go to Wilshire. Because this is the only church I visited once I left the other church. Uh, and then I was able to tell my manager at the time that I am attending a Baptist church. So, you know, you can stop being ugly toward me, but it didn't help. But that manager is no longer there. Um, so the Lord, after many, many years, removed him uh, from that hospital. So things are much better. Well, you know, you said this is not all about you, but I'm so sorry I have to make this a little about you. Um, this, young, this lady here is one of the reasons that I can sit here right now and not be out of my mind more than I am. She takes her care seriously, even outside the role of chaplain. And I just want to say thank you, Gina, for being exactly what God needed you to be to me four years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that's the, you know, part of the other thing that I have learned of being at Wilshire. I've been able to minister to several of those of you all in Sunday school or have been able to be that listening ear, that comforting presence. And that's what it's all about for me. 100% is doing and being what God has called me to do and be. And as I said before, I'm very, very passionate about palliative care. Uh, and if any of you have any questions about that, I'd be more than willing to discuss that with you. I just have one more comment too, uh, just from a hospital perspective. And that is, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the patient and what that role is, but the other, the other half of what I find the chaplain's role is, is really related to the staff at the hospital. Mm -hmm. Terrible things happen to the staff every day. They lose people. Um, you know, we have shot up police cars bringing in our first responders, and it's a very um, you know, we have COVID for two and a half years, and the chaplains are the ones that shoulder our staff to keep them going. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your comments about that. Um, yes, you are, yeah. That's part of the mission field I learned about, uh, not only the patients, but the staff. Um, I can't tell you how many countless times that I've 
been approached by staff that they're having surgery or their mother's sick or they've had a bad day and what I have learned to do in those moments um, you know I used to oh let's step into this quiet place I stop drop and pray right there in the hallway <laughs> and they know they're going to get that from me and I just wherever we are we are people can go around us because we are in the moment of that is the need that they have um, is I've mentioned about the um, patients at the bedside that had I had to do weddings for in bringing in the staff to be flower girls and decorating <laughs> and them feeling that love and support as well during that ceremony uh, I've had doctors whose children have committed suicide and I you know they we we have a connection that you know they can openly talk to me about um, I had another young lady recently told me that her son well I knew her son committed suicide about 10 years ago and her daughter's gonna name her son after that child and she was able to say you remember Philip and my you know daughter's gonna name him Philip and I knew I could tell you and we hugged and loved each other so that you know she can openly say that this child whom she lost will also have the name of her new grandchild and so those kind of stories are um, very very significant in the hospital and in patient care um, uh, any other questions I do have one quick one uh, Jim mentioned I think what he was trying to ask which is pretty important if you go as a visitor go to visit somebody that is uh, dying you know they they're gonna die whether it's six months or whatever but you know that they're that they're going to die what are the things you should not say oh you know what you visitor? shouldn't say <laughs> yeah, tell me I, because uh, having been through that yeah I know what they are <laughs> right right um, no you don't understand um, but you want to be there to love them and support them how can you support them what is their need don't tell them what you think they need ask them what is their need and I amazingly have discovered silence and holding hands are a wealth of love you don't have to say anything you can't fix it you know, you can pray for them and pray for God's will to be done to fix it, but you cannot fix it. So don't try to fix it and don't use words that would fix it, but just be present, hold their hand if you're bringing a meal or you're bringing flowers. And I just wanna come and sit with you. I don't want, we don't have to talk, but let's just sit together because if you are coming to the hospital for one thing, that person knows the love and care you have for them. So just being present, being in the silence, holding hands is a wealth of love and support. Yeah. Would you close with prayer for our online people? I would love to close with a prayer. Thank you so kindly, everyone who was able to join us online. Let us humble ourselves right now and give thanks to God for this beautiful new day not like any other we've seen before or will see again. And Father, we pray humbly and boldly that you provide every need for those being present here and those online, that you would shine your light of love and comfort for them and their families. We thank you, Lord, for this special time to share and we thank you, Lord, for what you've done for each one of us to bring us to here. And Lord, we thank you for the promise of what you will do. In the silence, come, speak, touch, and provide for each one of us. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly and boldly pray. Amen. 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 Goodness.